Researcher on a mission with Dr. J. Andy Elias. Godfather of ufology, 58 years in ufology, researching, lecturing, literally going around the world. The only person that has testified at, at the actual Congress in, I, I believe, 1968, and again, 45 years later in 2013 at the Citizen UFO hearing, Mr. Stanton Friedman, who I'd like to say Stan the man. Mr. Friedman, welcome to the show. Delighted to be here, as well, usual. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Well, for, let's go with this first, the last piece of news, the first thing I wanted to ask you about. What do you yeah. think about this new Kepler 452B that was found, of course, by the new Kepler telescope, which has found so much more than those of who haven't been paying attention than, of course, the Hubble telescope. Well, it, it's an entirely different system from Hubble. H Hubble is in a fairly close uh, orbit around the Earth. It's a huge telescope able to see all kinds of things, and it can look almost anywhere. However, Kepler is looking at a, It's in orbit around the Earth, but an elongated orbit. It goes out and comes back and goes out and comes back. It's looking at a chunk of the sky about the size of your fist at arm's length. And one of the reports I saw is that it's looking uh, around the Milky Way. No, it isn't. It's looking at this tiny hunk of sky. And it's still finding an incredible number of planets because it seems certain, even though there will be better instrumentation later, but it seems certain that the galaxy and probably other galaxies are just full of planets. It's apparently a natural part of the, call it the life cycle of uh, stars, that when, you know, the, the number varies, the size of the planets vary, their orbit around the stars vary, but there's a ton of them out there. And it, it's one of those things. Fifty years ago, there were plenty of... Uh, uh, arrogant earthlings who were saying basically hey we got the only solar system around and we're on the only planet that's covered with water and so we're top of the heap and now uh we're more close to the bottom of the heap because we haven't been around that long the, this new planet the sun the star that it circles around is over six billion years old and we're a mere four point something or other billion years old so uh, no, we have no basis at all except our ego and our arrogance uh, for saying that uh, we're the top dogs. So it's an interesting find, and we've been expecting it, and those guys deserve a lot of credit. The sensitivity of the Kepler is, is extraordinary, the equivalent uh, in rough terms of being able to look at a car headlight a mile away and catch a butterfly going in front of the headlight. Uh, that's a pretty neat trick. And so I, I got to give it to those guys. I admire really good technology, and they've got it. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like I admire this uh, Pluto bypass, if you will. Uh, that nine and a half years, and you notice, or at least and, and none of the coverage of the Pluto, the New Horizons space mission, did I see a mention, maybe there, but I haven't seen it, of the fact that it's got a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, RTGs they're called, providing the power. Over 200 watts, it's been operating for almost 10 years. There's no battery on board. It's plutonium dioxide, U2, uh, PU-238, uh, no, it's not fissionable. You can't use it in a bomb. There's about 24 pounds of the stuff, and it's been producing power steadily. It, it loses about 4 watts a year. And you have to remember that some people think it's solar power. Hey, when you get out to the distance of Pluto from the sun compared to the Earth, the solar intensity, the amount of energy coming from received from the sun at that distance, is about a thousand times less than it is at Earth. So obviously solar power won't do the job. And RTGs have 
powered almost essentially all the deep space probes, you know, the Cassini and uh, th- th- there's a whole bunch of them uh, out around uh, Saturn and Jupiter and so forth. Uh, they're really neat devices. They're, they're not cheap, but you don't go to Walmart to buy one. But when you think about it, over nine years, steady operation. That is quite remarkable. So I was very pleased to see this stuff about Pluto. And one of the things that pleased me was there were surprises. That's why one does research. If one knew everything, one wouldn't have to do research. So we got a lot more information that's going to be coming from that system. I hope the instruments keep working for a long period of time. Uh, But they will have power, no question about that. And wherever we've looked around the solar system, we find surprises. Because despite our arrogance, we are also ignorant. And that leads to the question about the radio telescope search for extraterrestrial intelligence. There was a lot of noise about that this week, too. Huge story. A surprising story to me, anyway. Yuri Milner, a Soviet billionaire, is putting up $100 million to be spent between over a period of between five and ten years listening for signals using a tele- radio telescope in Australia and another one in Ohio uh, to listen for signals from outer space. But do you think that's, though, a little outdated? Because I saw an article a few months ago that maybe the reason we haven't been receiving much for via radio is because we should be actually probably looking for maybe artificial light on other planets. And SETI was possibly looking at maybe even changing tactics of looking into these new planets that they're finding, the new Goldilocks planets, to see if there's artificial light on that. Well, I I think, look, I'm not a fan of SETI. I call it the silly effort to investigate. It's based on a number of strange premises. There's nobody coming here. Look, if there's somebody coming here, why would you look out there? You'd look here. Learn sign language. Don't tell me about radio signals. There is not a shred of evidence so far that anybody intelligent out there, we won't ask the question, is there intelligent life on Earth? We certainly don't act like it some of the time. But there is not a shred of evidence that I have seen that there are signals coming from intelligent beings out there to Earth. There's an enormous amount of evidence indicating aliens are visiting Earth, even if they don't want to talk to the SETI community. And, you know, it, it's kind of crazy. A hundred million bucks over several years is enough to get people excited about doing research with radio telescopes. Do I think it's a sensible way to find out about intelligent aliens? No, I don't. I mean, you know, physical trace cases, radar visual sightings, abduction cases, all the proof that there is a cover-up, call it what you want, a cosmic water date I like, uh, why aren't we spending a tiny fraction of that amount on those things? One reason might be the government would be very unhappy if they did. Uh, and people say, what are you, a conspiracy theorist? No. It's easy, truly easy to demonstrate that we're not being told the truth about UFOs or not being told what we've already learned, uh, even if that doesn't include everything there is to be learned. Uh, example one. The National Security Agency, uh, in response to a legal action under freedom of information a number of years ago, released 156 top-secret Umbra pages of UFO documents. Uh, The problem was that you could only read one line per page. Everything else was whited out. And and that's actually a a little bit better than some of the other redacted ones where they were blacked out and all you could see is the date. Well, that's the CIA. Yeah. buddies at the CIA, you see, the the Washington Post a couple of years back said that the total military military intelligence budget for the United States was $52.6 billion. That includes the CIA, the NSA, and also the NRO, National Reconnaissance Office. 
That was the annual budget two years ago. It doesn't sound right. $52 million. I would think it would be... Billion. Billion. I would think it would be maybe closer to... Uh, I mean, I'm just speculating with all these operations going on and wars going on. I would think it would be... I don't know. I mean, what's our annual budget in the, in the trillion? The military budget for the world is a trillion dollars. But I'm talking about the military budget uh, for, for the United States government. $52.6 billion in one year. That's a lot of money. We're not talking about buying tanks and guns and stuff. You know, we're talking about spies and listening and spy satellites, of course. Uh, but that's a heck of a lot of money. And the, the reason I've mentioned that, what I've found is that the what I call the ancient academics and fossilized physicists uh, don't have any concept, it appears to me, of how much money is spent on advanced research and development outside of academia. And, you know, we're talking, well, uh, for an example, uh, Los Alamos lab, they have over 7,000 employees. And their budget annual these years is running 2.2 billion dollars for that one lab. That's a lot of money. We're not talking about 20 uh, professors and 40 grad students. We're talking about a massive effort. Lots of people involved in all kinds of interesting, exciting, and classified work. Uh, so the perspective that I find, uh, it, well, let me give you another example. I've had several people tell me uh, Stan, if Roswell really had happened, as I'm convinced it did, uh, they would have had to pull all of physics props out of their campuses. How absurd. The guys you pull out have to have very high-level security clearances, and there are plenty of them working under government contract, like at Los Alamos, at Livermore, at uh, Hanford Works, at Oak Ridge. These are major installations with all kinds of professional people working there. And like the people who worked on stealth aircraft and stuff like that in industry. They're not in academia. So, you know, uh, there are questions. We don't know a lot about what some of these guys are doing. That's the whole point. The work is classified, and I don't have a need to know. I get asked questions from people that would imply that uh, I have a pipeline to the inside story on Roswell, for example. Sure, I'm the original civilian investigator of the Roswell incident. And that goes back to the 70s. But I certainly don't have a need to know or a high-level security clearance. I had a Q clearance for 14 years, but that wouldn't have gotten me into the, U into the UFO scene. Now, Q, and I Q, don't Q now. clearance. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Isn't that the highest level clearance you can have above top well, for a civilian? Uh, and I, I wouldn't call it that. I would say it's the point of the Q clearance is access to nuclear information. Nuclear, yes. By the AEC, yes. right? Well, there is no AEC anymore. There, there's uh, Department of Energy and... There are all kinds of people, like I mentioned, the spy companies, if you will, the CIA, NSA, NRO. But uh, what you want is a top-secret code word clearance. That's why I said top-secret umbra. That's the, it isn't enough to have a top-secret clearance to see that information. You've got to have an appropriately uh, – the word after top-secret, it can be ultra, it can be umbra. You've got to be read into that project. And there are some projects that only five people have access to. And the thing is, the need to know is, is a big part of this story. When I was working on radiation shielding for General Electric Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Department, it's a small program. In 1958, we spent $100 million. We employed 3,500 people, of whom 1,100 were engineers and scientists. So it wasn't an enormous program. A pretty good size compared to a college research and development. But I found uh, in classified abstracts papers about radiation shielding being done by the Navy. And I couldn't get them. I had the right clearance. But I didn't have a need to know. And the nuclear Navy people said, no way, Jose. We're not giving you a need to know. This is our stuff. 
And incidentally, one of the big mysteries in the whole question of UFOs is where is the data from the Navy? Hmm. And I recently got a letter back from the Office of Naval Intelligence. I sent a Freedom of Information Act request to them for UFO stuff. We don't have any, they said. And look, I've talked to loads of former Navy people who tell me about sightings while they're on the ocean. So there's a place, a complete cover-up. The, the curtain is down. We don't get any of that stuff. Uh, and I wish uh, Yuri Milner, who's given this $100 million for SETI, would spend a little of it to take legal action against the Navy and you know the NSA and those for UFO stuff. But, you know, think about it. The Navy... We have the world's largest Navy. We got loads of ships and planes and uh, personnel out there. They obviously have a pretty good view of the sky, uh, and they have to monitor the skies so that we don't have another Pearl Harbor kind of thing. I mean, don't tell me they're not looking at the skies. You know, they are looking at the skies. So it would be nice to file an action against uh, the Navy. To say, okay, I believe you. The ONI doesn't have anything. Who does? And I say that because we have the dear old General Carol Bolander memo. You remember that one. That's the one that says uh, sightings which could affect national security are made in accordance with JNAP 146, Joint Army, Navy, Air Force, Publication 146, or Air Force Manual 55-11, and are not part of the Blue Book system. This was said in 1969, and that's it resulted in the closure of Project Blue Book. But he also said, we have this in writing. I think it was released by mistake, but anyway, he also said that if we close Project Blue Book, which has always been touted for many years anyway, as the only government group concerned with UFOs, if we close Project Blue Book, uh, people will, the public won't have a place to report sightings. However, as previously noted, reports which could affect national security will continue to be investigated using the procedures designed for that purpose. Now, that's an extraordinary statement that contradicts every statement the Air Force has made for the last 40 years. I called uh, General Bolander 10 years later. I didn't see the memo until 10 years later. And he agreed with me. There are two independent channels, one for stuff that could affect national security and one run-of-the-mill sightings. You mentioned earlier the number of sightings has gone up. Yeah, MUFON had over 1,100 sightings last month, reports, sighting reports. Now, I find that when I check my audiences that after my lecture, I still don't have courage enough to do it before my lecture. I find that 10% of the people have had a sighting, but 90% of them didn't report it, mainly because of fear of ridicule. And, and that's so, one thing that's actually changed now, right? And that's why I was making that argument earlier. Do you think the reason why we have more reports is because less people fear ridicule as opposed to 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago? Well, I think that's part of the story. But I think the Kepler findings, the attitudes of the last few years have changed. I, I constantly get young people telling me, well, surely we're not alone. There were plenty of people who 30, 40, 50 years ago would say that we're the only civilization because if there was somebody out there, we would know about it. We're so smart. Uh, the arrogance has gone out of that. Uh, perception, I think. And I'm glad no. you brought that up because the noisy negativists, as you coined the term, even when I was in elementary school, we were told there is no other solar system. This is it. And this is the only planet that has water and life on it. And all out is out there are stars and gas and dust. That's it. No other planets. And, and this is what I was taught in, in my generation. So Sorry these, about that. <laughs> yeah. So obviously all these these educators in, in that era, especially I can't even imagine what was going on in the era before that, which happened to your era, is a, is a very scary thought. Yeah, I'm sure they're probably kicking themselves in or biting their tongue with from what the findings are today because they were so conclusively sure that 
we were alone, that there was nothing out there. And I'm sure when Kepler found the first planet, extra, tra, extra solar, or however you want to call it, planet that exists outside of our solar system, probably blew them away, especially when they found the first Goldilocks planet. Well, they were, they were expecting to find something because they had more sense than the ancient academics and fossilized physicists. And, you know, it, it's... Look, there's my book, uh, Science Was Wrong, by Kathleen Martin and I, has 14 chapters, each one devoted to dealing with a false claim made by a smart person. And it is interesting that one of the people involved with this thing that Yuri Milner is funding uh, listening for signals. One of the guys is Lord Rees, the R E E S, the British Astronomer Royal. He's the same guy who, not very long ago, said that only kooks see UFOs. Did he give a source for that misinformation? No. Is there any basis for it? No. It's total nonsense. But he's part of the group that's pushing this SETI uh, stuff, if you will. And so. You know, I don't mind keeping some of those guys working. What the hell? What else are they going to do? Uh, we don't want them to collect unemployment. But if you're talking about searching for extraterrestrial intelligence, the data says it's coming here. We don't know what they're doing out there. And there's another thing. Uh, we act as if technology doesn't change. And my rule is just the reverse of that. That technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. Now, to think that people are stuck at our level of technology, radio signals, uh, seems to me to be quite absurd. And the example I use, I don't use a slide rule anymore. I did when I started working in industry a long time ago. But there are better ways of making calculations today than using slide rules. There are better ways of doing almost anything that you can think of. Uh, you know, you could say, how long does it take to go around planet Earth? Well, Magellan set the record, or his ship did, he didn't make it, uh, three years. But that was back in 1523. Now, uh, today the space station does it. Didn't three guys just go up today, I think? Uh, to join the space station. It does it in just under 100 minutes. So I was just going to say, yeah, a little over 90 minutes, under two hours, a little over 90 minutes, just like you said, under 100 minutes. That's in an insane amount. So you have three years, 500 years ago, or 400 plus years ago, almost yeah. 500, and now you have under two hours. I mean, just, I, can you imagine what the people in that era, if they were alive today, <laughs> they, they're probably rolling in their graves. Well, They'd say, I want a piece of the action. That's exciting, man. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, I, I want to say a couple things because we're getting clear halfway. And I, I first of all, uh, just in case before we run out of time, I, I want people to be able to find you. Let's talk real quick about your websites and upcoming tours and, okay. and anything like that. Well, I'm my website is www.stantonfriedman.com. That's F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N.com. Uh, and that lists my lectures, and I'll be speaking, uh, oh, you'll see all the list of lectures in a place called uh, Liverpool, Nova Scotia. I'm giving a paper on the 8th of August at a conference, Paracon East, a paranormal convention, a shorthand form. And my paper there will be the first time I've given this one is Crash Saucers from Roswell, to Shag Harbor, which isn't too far from where I'm going to be in Liverpool. That's exciting. It's listed uh, on my website. And uh, then a few weeks later, I'll be at uh, the Experiencers Conference in Portland. And then I'll be doing research down where I was supposed to be last year, but a little heart attack got in my way at the American Philosophical Society. Thank God you're okay, though. Yeah. Uh, and then I will be speaking at the incident at Exeter location, Exeter, New Hampshire, uh, the 5th and 6th of September. Uh, they have the 50th anniversary of the incident at Exeter. And that was John uh, Fuller's book, uh, same guy who wrote uh, The Interrupted Journey about Betty and Barney Hill. And uh, he did a fine job on that. And it was an excellent case, and, and I love the explanation that the debunkers put forward. 
It was an aircraft refueling operation. Huh. I love really, that. and it was down below tree level. Boy, that's a neat trick. What did you say? <laughs> yeah, refuel, refuel aerially uh, under tree level. That makes perfect sense, right? What are they going to refuel? Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, you want to keep it quiet. You know, we don't want the Russians to spy on it. I mean, it's absurd, but it's typical. If the first explanation doesn't work, try the second. If that doesn't work, try the third. Because we know there are no alien visitors to Earth. If there were, we smart debunkers would know about it. That's the kind of crazy reasoning we're dealing with here. But fortunately, but, uh, though, we have uh, amazing people that are interested. And that's one of the reasons I not only did I want people to be able to find you and know your books. I, I'm glad you mentioned Science Was Wrong. You've also co-written, of course, with uh, Kathleen Marden, Captured, which was yep. the uh, the newest update on Betty and Barney Hill. You wrote Crash at Corona. I, several others, I, if you want to list those names. Flying quick. Saucers and Science was the one I'm proudest of because that's, that's my own, just me. Uh, and, well, Crash and Corona, that too. Wasn't that your own? Which? Crash and Corona? I'm with Don Berliner. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I did most of the research. He did most of the writing. He's written lots of stuff. I'm a, I'm a latecomer to this book writing business. I'm the, uh, who's the famous uh, artist? Uh, uh, da Vinci? Start, no, a woman who uh, didn't start painting until she was, over 60, something like that. Anyway, uh, uh, I'll think of her name next week. <laughs> <laughs> the old guy's got to watch out for that. But, uh, yeah, it, it's I, I, I've enjoyed writing the books. I wish I'd gotten started sooner, but I was busy. 700 lectures, I put a lot of miles on the old bod, man. No, Speaking about what you've done, actually, we have a, a question or something from a listener. This is uh, Nico from Chicago, and he wants to know, it says, how is Stan's health doing? And this is from TuneIn. Oh, well, okay. Uh, you care admittedly, about uh, they care June about 27th, too. June 27th, last year, I had a heart attack. And it kept me from attending the MUFON conference, and it kept me from attending Roswell. And so I've already been at Roswell this year. I, it, I had to spend a week in the hospital just because of the timing and was bored stiff, read several books. Uh, they put in two stents. I'm working fine. Haven't even taken any nitro. And I've got a fairly heavy schedule if you look at the website. Uh, I will be at the MUFON conference in California, Irvine, California, September the Roughly the 24th. I should look at the calendar here. Yeah, 24th. Yeah, the 25th, symposium. 25th. That's right. It's going to be a very big deal. I, as a matter of fact, you're going to be there. I know Paul Hellier's going to be there. I, yes. I highly recommend that. I look forward to seeing you there again. Uh, and speaking of lectures, this is one of the things I want to get in before. I know we have, sadly, we, you can't do this full two hour show. We're, you're only doing this one hour show. I want to make it a point that. At their lectures, you, you said to one, you said one thing, and I want to say the second thing: that at, only after you speak do you ask the question, "How many people have seen something?" and then "How many people have reported it?" Which is virtually none of them, or a small portion of them, ten percent. Ten percent. And another thing I want to make a big point of is it's not necessarily tinfoil hat kooks that are attending these lectures. You've lectured in front of some of the most prestigious people. Last interview we did, you talked about. I asked you what were your, some of your best and, and your 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 best and worst experiences in lecturing, and you talked about an experience where you were invited to speak in, I believe, Saudi Arabia, where Bill Clinton yes. happened to be in the audience, and and another one with Bill Gates. No, he he spoke. He was a keynote speaker, okay. but he wasn't there when we had our seventy-five minutes of fame when five of us were on a panel. Uh, in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, of all places, uh, talking about uh, flying saucers. Uh, Nick Pope was there. I was there. Uh, Michel Kaku was there. Jacques Vallée was there. And there was a scientist from Arabia, and I can't remember his name. I had trouble pronouncing it at the time. Uh and we were very well received. The people paid a thousand bucks to attend this uh, three-day uh, event, incidentally. So we had captains of industry and chief pilots and stuff like that. Uh, it was an interesting experience, 
top CEOs and important people. And that just goes to show the, the, the level of people who, uh, t the, the, the interest in ufology literally oh, no question all around. Um, Engineering societies, sections of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, American Nuclear Society section at Los Alamos. We had 500 people there. Engineering Society of Detroit, one of my early big lectures, 1,008 people for dinner and a talk, and there wasn't, weren't any uh, negative questions. So, yeah, I've been out there. I put it out on the line. Uh, all 50 states, colleges in all 50 states, 10 provinces, and 18 other countries. So I, I put my more than put my foot in the water. Uh, I hope I haven't put my foot in my mouth. But. No. You, you haven't, but you know. Let, let, let me ask you this because uh, another tweet just came in from a listener, and uh, we've been getting a lot of questions lately uh, from the listeners that because Jeremy Corbell spoke the other day about finding a new witness to corroborate Bob Lazar's story, and it happened to be, I think, uh, Krangle was the name. And here's Dr. the Dr. Krangle, yeah. Dr. Robert Krangle, PhD. He, Here's the question. This comes from Graviton Fitch. Not to be confrontation, confrontational with Stanton, but his opinion on New Witness would be interesting. What, what is your opinion on this wit so well, witness? Uh, what do you think? Obviously, when I first heard about him, I didn't have an opinion. I have, my rule is have facts in hand before putting mouth in gear. So I called him. I was able to find his number, and I spoke with him. We had a, a long talk very comfortable talking to him. He's a scientist who worked uh, from time to time as a consultant to Los Alamos. And there were a couple of things that were clear. One, no surprise, he had seen Bob Lazar at Los Alamos. And I say no surprise because the phone book for uh, Los Alamos had Bob's name in it. Darn a lot of Robert S. Lazar's, you know. And it gave a number, and that was the number, as it happens, of the big Clinton P. Anderson Maison Accelerator, unique uh, nuclear physics facility. That doesn't make him a scientist, because they got all kinds of technicians out there. But there's no question he was there, and there's no question he had a security clearance. And uh, But again, uh, you can't get into Los Alamos and spend any time there without a security clearance. You certainly can't work there without one. That's the rule of the game. Whenever I visited there, when I was working on nuclear rockets for Westinghouse, our security officer had to send my credentials, the, an indication of my security level, uh, my clearance level, to Los Alamos. I couldn't get in without that. So, okay, he verified that Bob had been seen there and that Bob had a security clearance. He was at briefings that had classified material. However... When I asked him, well, did you check on his credentials in any way? No, of course not. Why would he? Now, he said he looked like a scientist. He had the pocket protector, the glasses. You know, everybody thought of him as doing some kind of scientific work, and I've never denied that. But no, and the interesting thing is he got his uh, Ph.D. from, uh, Crankle did, from MIT. But several years before, Bob claims to have been there. And, of course, my big objection, which Jeremy or anybody else has corrected, George Knapp says he doesn't think Bob have those degrees that he claimed. And I say that's one reason that I don't believe what he says about back engineering flying saucers, because if he can't tell the truth about himself, and I checked MIT, and I checked Caltech, and I checked his high school, and he was in the bottom third of his class, he couldn't have received a degree. He couldn't have been admitted to MIT. He also claimed at uh, the Little Alien, that wonderful hamburger joint in Nevada, that uh, he named a certain guy as having been a professor of physics at Caltech when he was there. Well, I called that guy as a member of the American Physical Society, to which I belong to, of course, and which Bob doesn't belong. And he never taught at Caltech, only at Pierce Junior College. And he did have Bob in a class there. Now, Bob also said that his uh, credentials were wiped out, if you will, at MIT. Well, if he didn't have any credentials and he didn't go there, then that's a lie as well. So the guy's obviously a bright guy. I watched him speak in Arizona. I'm not saying he's a stupid jerk or anything like that. I've never said that. He's bright. 
he built a jet-powered car. He puts on fireworks displays. I don't doubt that he did some technical work out of Los Alamos. But how you go from that to back engineering flying saucers, especially when he claims that, uh, and now he's denying, but it, it's on record, he claims that Los Alamos had 500 pounds of element 115, which would be most remarkable because the half-life is less than a couple of minutes, and there's no way anybody has 500 or 10 pounds of element 115. So Dr. Crankle, Crankle did provide evidence for those who think that Bob never worked at Los Alamos and those who think he didn't have a security clearance. He did not provide any particular indication that Bob was a scientist or worked anywhere, Area 51 or S-4 or whatever, on back engineering UFOs, which is the whole thing that makes the story so exciting. So uh, I talked to Crangle. I didn't hear what Jeremy said recently, of course. But I know uh, I talked specifically about whether Dr. Crangle had, uh, he didn't know who I was, but why should he? Uh, and I gave him enough background, I guess, to let him know that I, you know, I belong to the American Physical Society. He can look me up in the American Nuclear Society and so forth. He, he can check on me. Uh, but he did not provide any kind of evidence. He didn't try to. didn't say he had any that Bob had worked on back engineering flying saucers. And look, I think George Knapp is probably the top journalist in ufology. Seriously, he's been at it a long time. He's a great speaker, I've heard him. Uh, and he, he, he knows his stuff. And when I, my book, Flying Saucers and Science, came out, to be on Coast to Coast, I wanted George to be the one who interviewed me. And he was, and he read the book, and he asked great questions. It was a fine interview, because I have the greatest respect for him. I don't understand why, when he says that Bob didn't tell the truth uh, about his uh, degrees and stuff, why he believes everything else. But that's George's and my problem. Jeremy did not, uh, Dr. Crankle didn't say, oh, yes, I checked, and he was a physicist working for Los Alamos. I saw his name his job title or whatever on some kind of piece of paper. Nobody has said that. So he I, confirmed I, to you that he he worked there or that he ran into him? Is that what he did? He, he saw him a few times there. He knew who he was. And, it, it you know, once the, the big noise hit the fan, uh, he certainly was aware that uh, Bob was no longer working there. And, uh, you know, he may have been talking out of turn on classified stuff he didn't know. Uh, so there's no question there was a real Bob Lazar who really was at Los Alamos uh, and I've not disputed that uh, you know but that's why I went further because people were asking me as a known nuclear physicist uh, did I buy into his story and I wasn't going to say yes or no without checking on it and I, w I was shocked and as a matter of fact George Knapp is to be congratulated for giving me the name of Bob's high school uh, that's how I made contact with them, uh, was George gave me the, the name of the school. So If he went to uh, Pierce College, which is here in Los Angeles, did I, did I go to high school here in Los Angeles as well? No, he, this was in New York. Ah, so he went coast State. to coast, literally. Okay. Yeah, uh, this goes back. I mean, you know, he's in his 50s. He's not a... a well, he's a lot younger than I am, <laughs> admittedly, but... <laughs> So, you know, I don't, as I say, I don't know what Jeremy said, but I do know that Dr. Krangel verified that Bob worked at the lab and had a security clearance and was thought to be a scientist, thought to be, but he had done nothing to validate, verify, whatever you want to call it, that that was true, that Bob was a scientist who worked, and certainly nothing to say that he worked on a back engineering flying saucers. And uh, Krangel agreed with me that uh, talking about 500 pounds of element 115 seemed way beyond reality. And when, 
what element 115 one thing i thought that was really interesting about it was didn't german scientists not too long ago i say within the last five seven years maybe earlier or later than that actually were able to create it or well yes i mean look it had been expected it's a trans uranium uh, uranium element that is uranium has the highest, uh, highest atomic number of all of the elements uh, naturally occurring elements 92 and it was known well we knew about neptunium we knew about plutonium these are higher but they are basically man made when we have uh, atom bombs using plutonium it's made by taking uranium and putting it in a reactor and gradually building up the uh, plutonium uh, it doesn't occur really worth talking about in nature so there's a whole batch of theoretical nuclear physicists who worry about uh, a high atomic number elements 113 115 117 and it had been talked about. There were articles in Scientific American. Finally, several years ago, uh, there were was a big accelerator that was operated for roughly a month and produced four atoms of element 115. Uh, we made a lot of measurements to get the particles that were coming off from that. And then it had to be confirmed at another facility it was a joint American, Russian, and then the Germans were in Darmstadt, I think, uh, uh, were involved to verify that indeed, altogether we probably made uh, 100 atoms. And to do anything useful, you need, say, a, a pound would be 10 followed by 23 zeros atoms. So 100 won't do it. And it has a very short half life, under two seconds in, in the isotopes that they found. And it's easy to say, well, maybe there's a long half-life element, uh, isotope. And there's not the slightest indication of that. Uh, and, yeah, we're talking about an island of stability. How's that for a great phrase? Uh, that doesn't mean it isn't radioactive. It means it's much less, it has a longer half-life than the other ones. But they're talking about elements up with the atomic numbers uh, 300, or atomic weights 300, uh, not element 115. So uh, Bob didn't predict it. He made a claim that that's what they use. And he got that information from a Scientific American article, which talked about element 115. How are you going to dispute somebody who says, well, they're using 115 when Ain't nobody able to get it at the time. So finally we got a big accelerator, ran it long enough. Somebody put out some good money for that. And, uh, hey, four atoms. That's exciting <laughs> from a theoretical physics viewpoint. Does it tell us anything about flying saucers? Not a darn thing. we we got about ten minutes left, so I'm going to ask you to go in any direction you want. But first let me go back to element 115 and in uh, elements in general. Uh, the fact that they decay so rapidly, does element 115, I mean, how, how long or how good is it or how, you know, what's the decay rate on that versus other elements? It's, it's half-life. Well, there's a whole range of half-life. Half of it's gone in under two minutes. Ouch. So really, this is something that decays faster than anything else because well, there of its half-life. There were, there were shorter half-life elements, too. There are elements that decay in uh, microseconds. Oh, wow. uh, so there's a whole range, but 115 with less than two minutes ain't long enough to do anything with it. You can't accumulate it if it's not there. I mean, in contrast, the power supply for the uh, Horizons, the New Horizons, the Pluto craft, uh, is plutonium 238, which is radioactive. Uh, and it decays about uh, four parts out of 238. The half-life is many, many years. So that you can accumulate. The half-life of cobalt-60 is five years. So we use it in, in a number of facilities around the world. But that's long enough for you to get some use out of it. Five years for only half of it, uh, you still got half of it. Not two minutes. 
not 10 seconds, but five years. So you got the whole range of uh, lifespans, if you will. And, you know, uh, it's not surprising that it's that short because all the transuranium elements, uh, especially over element 100, have quite short half-lives. I'm sorry, that's the way God created the universe, if you will. <laughs> Now, let's go back to the first story, or the actually, should I say the last story I left? And, and then we could talk about this as, or as long as short as we want because we have under 10 minutes before we hit the break. And of course, okay. I want you to have the final say in whatever you want. The, the fact that all these, uh, actually, we have a, a caller too, but the fact that we have all these uh, fines from NASA. Uh, what do you what do you think the implications are that that really the the rate of these Goldilocks planets is skyrocketing? Now, if you want to briefly answer that, and then we could take the caller who asked the question before uh, we run out of this hour. By all means. Well, th there's no question that we, we've had a change of heart. Frank Drake thought uh, several years ago he's big in the SETI movement that we, there might be as many as 8,000 places in the galaxy that could be sending signals. So you're looking for a needle in a haystack, you know, which, which place out there can we find? Okay, a good estimate today of how many planets there are in the galaxy is several billion. That's a conservative estimate. There's over 100 billion stars, and some people think everyone has got at least one planet. But let, let's let's be conservative. Let's say there's only five billion planets in the galaxy. So that's exciting, but uh, it, it's good to know we're not the only solar system. Uh, so I, I'm not surprised at that. I wouldn't have given you a number. How do you have a number when you don't know? This is something you measure, yes. and the Kepler is done. Huh? Fantastic. Remember now. It's looking at a space in the sky about the size of your fist at arm's length. It's not looking around all over the place. And in that small region of space, it's found well over a thousand planets. Now, how many are going to be the same size or close to it as Earth? We don't know yet. That's exciting to find out. How'd you like to make measurements and say, oh, I found a solar system with six planets in it? What? And I found some where. They're no more than twice as heavy as Earth. Wow. L let me just uh, make this one comment that you've said in the past before I, I bring this caller to a ask you a question. And like you've said in the past, of all these cases, whether it be with UFO cases or all these planets that we're looking for, if only one turns out to be extraterrestrial, literally, if only one of these UFOs has aliens flying in them from, from another planet, or only one of these planets have intelligent life, then end of mystery. It's solved, because all we need is one. That's it, one. Right. You know, and, and I think that's just a fantastic thing that so many people forget. We don't need to analyze 10,000 cases or 10 million. Maybe we need to analyze that many to get to that one. But once we get to that one, end of story. Let me bring on this caller. And okay. I actually know who it is. He called the other night. This happens to be Lou Sheehan. Lou Sheehan, welcome to the show. Do you have a question for Mr. Friedman? Uh, in some sense, yes, Dr. J. Good evening, Mr. Friedman. I had the pleasure of meeting you briefly at Contact in the Desert. Oh. You gave me a name of uh, another MJ-12 uh, suspect. But I'm calling in because, according to Wikipedia, I'm just telling you this, and I have two related things. According to Wikipedia, the half-life of element 115 is 220 milliseconds. Now, I can't vouch for Wikipedia, and I, I don't mean to overly correct you, but it's much worse than you're even saying. It's not two seconds. I'm trying to be conservative. I'm well, it's me, under sir. two minutes. That's for sure. <laughs> That's true. The, um, there's a there's a uh, special on Nova Science now with Mike uh, with Mr. Tyson, uh, and they say Field that they Tyson. expect the they expect the uh, uh, island of stability to be at one fourteen, not one fifteen. It's about a seventeen minute show. It's excellent for anybody who's unfamiliar with islands of stability and creating these elements at this at these high levels. Uh, again, I'm just trying to get Dr. J and, and his uh, followers to watch it. And you know, I assume some will, but it's simply an excellent, excellent when is video. That show? So, Do you know? 
Oh, it's past. It's it's available oh. online in high quality. Um, it's, I believe it's either 14 minutes or 17 minutes because I watched it again the other day before <laughs> after having spoken to a previous guest. Um, I'll be happy to send it to you. I, I I at least have your old email address. I'll send you a link to it if I can dig out your email address or if you want to leave it on the show. Right. If you look on my it's website, like, it's there. Right, right, right. Will do. Um, it's excellent. Uh, absolutely excellent. And again, well, so thanks Dr. for your... Tyson, you know, is the guy who said that our fastest craft would take 70,000 years to get to the next star, the closest star, and so forget about interstellar travel. He forgot to add one little detail. It doesn't have a propulsion system on it. Well, it's like throwing a bottle know, in I the just, ocean. I, you know. <laughs> there, oh, two things, if I may. Um, you know, SETI. I just want to make sure I understand. Uh, Lou, I just want to warn you. Go ahead, ask these questions, but we do have less than five minutes before break, before he's okay, got to go. Okay, I'll give short answers. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, this will be relatively short. Uh, the signals that they look for, those signals essentially are not, if a, if so, a being from another planet sends a signal, it's not going to blanket the Earth. They actually have to send a signal. It's still narrow. It's rather narrow, and yes. SETI's uh, receptor has to be exactly lined up. That's my understanding. Is that correct, Mr. Freeman? That's that right. Bad? Oh my God! It's very okay. difficult. It means it's very difficult. Uh, you know, uh, it's like pointing a gun and hoping you hit somebody a uh, hundred miles away, but you don't know where exactly. he is, and you're just doing it randomly. So, yeah, yes. the whole SETI thing. That there's a whole chapter in my book, Flying Saucers and Science, huh. about SETI and and the problems with SETI as it's presently conceived. That's why okay, I call well, it silly effort up. to investigate. Oh, it's more than silly. It's hyper, hyper silly. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, hey, I'm I conservative. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks again, uh, Mr. Friedman. Okay. Thank, thank you, Lou, for calling, by all means. Mr. Friedman, we have a couple minutes before break, so yeah. I actually want to turn it to you to talk about whatever you want to talk about. Well, I, okay. Uh, these are exciting times. I'm looking forward to my trips coming up, the lectures I'm going to be giving, the response to them. Uh, we'll gain recognition for MJ-12 in a couple places. Uh, it's an exciting time, and I think the world is moving in my direction, uh, and uh, it will be interesting. Uh, I'm going to be at the American Philosophical Society Library, and I'll be looking at some of the debunker materials and uh, when I do that, normally I find more things to say, oh, these guys are crazy, uh, you know, or, that makes no sense, or that's not true, or stuff like that. But you got to have the facts in hand before putting your mouth in gear. So I'm excited about being able to, I was supposed to be there last year, but the heart attack got in the way. So uh, I'll be there this year. I'm looking forward to the 50th anniversary of the Exeter incident that that aircraft refueling operation below tree height, you know, that, that's, that's a rather magnificent thing. <laughs> it says here in small print. Uh, and I'll be, for those in Canada, uh, I will be in Liverpool, Nova Scotia. I've never been there uh, down on the South Shore. And uh, talking about crash saucers, I'll talk about five of them. Uh, three in New Mexico and then Kecksburg, and as uh, well, Aztec is in New Mexico, and, and there's another one. Uh, well, it, it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to it. And for people, I, I I'll, I'll even give out my email address because uh, I won't get jammed uh, at this time. Uh, F S P H Y S. That stands for flying saucer physicist. I tried 10 other things, and none of them worked, so I picked up <laughs> nobody else is going to have. F-S-P-H-Y-S at bellalliant.net, B-E-L-L-A-L-I-A-N-T dot net. So I'm reachable. I do respond to emails. I even answer. Somebody was surprised. I answer my own phone. <laughs> Who else is going to answer it? You know? I actually remember you telling the story of once uh, when someone called and you actually answered, and they were blown away because they were like, "Well, wasn't there supposed to be a secretary or something like that?" I don't have a secretary. I'm a one-man operation. <laughs> I do my thing, uh, and I'm lucky to have had a chance to do that for all these years. 
uh, you know, I'm blessed with long life. Uh, at least I'll be 81 uh, in a, on the 29th of this month, so it's coming right up. Ah, really? That's and both my parents six days. lived to be 90, and so I got nine more years to go. Huh? That's good enough for me. Well, with that being said, we have to wish you happy birthday. And if you have any final words, that being said, we have to go to break. So I'd like to thank you for joining us, Mr. Friedman. We definitely have to have you on again. And if I don't speak to you before your birthday, let me wish you a happy birthday now. On behalf of me, on the network, everybody else out there, and I'm sure Art Bell when he hears about it, your birthday coming up next week. So <laughs> I'll look forward to doing this show. <laughs> thanks again. You have a great night, and everybody thanks. stay tuned. We'll be-
they, oh, she, oh. yeah, she finally came oh. forward and spoke about her ordeal. But the, the point I was saying is, is going back to when you were saying that the Maelstrom, the Air Force Base in, incident, those 10 nuclear ICBMs, according to Solace, they were individually controlled. You can't shut one off and uh, a domino effect with all the other ones. Each one had to have been tampered with. So this UFO was targeting all of them. It's not like it just targeted one little area and, and set them all off. And that's what I thought was really interesting. Uh, I think he sent a message, they didn't they? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And th- and now we could look back and know that that was not the only uh, no nuclear site they visited, right? We we know Rendlesham right. had nuclear weapons there, and they were hovering near the the weapons storage facilities. Do you know hey, often in the Soviet Union too? Except there, it was the other way around. They certainly went online instead of offline. <laughs> that was pretty scary ready to launch uh, unintentionally what's going on here you know can you tell us that story say that again can you tell us that story well i don't know a lot about it other than um salas uh, talks about it uh he'd heard it uh the uh the commander i guess is the right word of the base uh, suddenly gets informed that the missiles are hot ready to roll and it can't yeah. be, and they managed to, to shut them down. But it was kind of one of those scary moments, as you can imagine, for the people on site. He had to take a World life death here, decision. You know. yeah. Basically, it, it, he took the humane decision to say, hold up a second, I have to look at the circumstances, the possibilities, and I know this is calling for the queen and country, or in his case, the king and country of the, the czar. But he took the decision to say it can't be real and said no. So he took a human decision. Uh, I think a lot of people that are, you know, uh, compartmentalized, uh, they don't ask questions, they just do what they're told. They're the ones that frighten me because I think if it had been on their watch, we would have been at war, you know. But this general took a decision. I think, too, we we need to realize something else. Going back to Bob Salas for a minute. The guys at missile launch sites, the guys who have their fingers on the button, so to speak, are are carefully evaluated psychologically. Uh, You know, it's strange duty. You're down in a hole there. You have tremendous responsibility. You can't avoid them. You know, you can't take a day off kind of thing. And uh, they need to be psychologically uh, adapted for that purpose. you know, you don't want a guy who's going to lose his temper, <laughs> who's going to take out a personal grudge uh, with his finger on a button. No way, Jose. And so the worst are, thing you want. You could st- you have one man yeah. that could essentially start a, a world war and end the, the planet right. as we know it. Well, that, that's right. So what, what I'm getting at here is to go back to the original question. From an alien viewpoint, we're a bunch of idiots. And, I mean, I certainly don't need to tell anybody living in England that war is devastating. Uh, I'm glad I didn't have to go through what you guys went through. Although in my little school in Linden, New Jersey, we had some students from England. Their family sent them over during the war because uh, they were concerned about the bombing and all the rest. And war is not fun. Uh You know, I I worry about the people playing computer games, you know, because everybody gets up and goes home. (laughs) War is real, uh, and it's hell. And uh, it's one of the amazing feats of the last 70 years is that we haven't used any more nuclear weapons on people. Despite how many wars have we got, got going on, you know, Korea and Vietnam and... Uh, Syria and you know you name it they're they're all over the place uh, that's what worries me about Iran getting uh, uh, nuclear weapons because I don't think they would show much restraint uh, going back to war in the UK you know I remember asking my dad because I was just after the war I'm, I'm a sort of 60s baby uh, boomer baby but um, I do remember asking my dad about the war because I could never fathom why we were fighting our cousins and why how Queen had to change her name, you know? Um, 
I still don't today understand why we went to war twice with Germany. Uh, I can see a bigger picture, but uh, it still doesn't make common sense to me how we could murder our cousins, our neighbours. And war for me is, is an atrocious thing, you know. I, I resent war sure. completely. Well, I do too. And, uh, you know, like I say, I grew up through it, but fortunately I was in the United States and we didn't have to... We had air raid wardens and we worried. I lived in a little town in New Jersey and right on the coast, and we had a big oil refinery there that made 90% of the high-octane fuel used during World War II by the United States and Britain, too, for that matter. 90%. We were worried about German submarines coming along the coast and uh, dropping a few shells and starting a huge fire and so forth. Well, we were the end of the big-inch pipeline from Texas that brought the raw crude up. Uh, better than sending by ship where it was subject to submarines and so forth. And so we we worried about the war in the sense of air raid wardens and, you know, close your drapes and keep your lights out and, and all kinds of things, drills. But it certainly had nothing, it didn't compare at all with what was going on in England. We never had a bomb dropped on the United States or a V-2 rocket or a V-1 rocket or any of these things. So I, I have great admiration. And, you know, I, we, my wife and I visited the Soviet Union a couple of years, three years ago, and we were in Leningrad. How did they hold off the Germans? They lost a million people in the siege of Leningrad. Uh, I mean, the winter helped. Uh, just as it helped defeat Napoleon. But uh, thank goodness the Russians were holding them off. I don't know how they managed, frankly. Terrible losses. But the Russians lost more than 20 million people during the war. Uh, that's a lot of people. It's it's really sad that 50 million people died as a result of the, the war. But we have to be thankful for the people that sacrificed their lives because I fear that had they not had the Russians not been able to hold off the Nazis in, in Leningrad, we might all be under uh, Hitler's legacy's rule. And, and that would be, uh, I think, of even a more oppressive state than had we been under, say, oh, communist no rule. No question. And I, being Jewish, there wouldn't have been any of us left if Hitler had won the war. Well, I find it strange how, you know, just a couple of years after the war, we then had Project Paperclip, where, you know, Nazis were brought to America, to White Sands, uh, Von Braun yeah. and, and people like this. And then even today, a few years after the war, uh, we then had the start up of the CIA and the NSA. And these were the same German people. Uh, that, that were from the Project Paperclip, that were at the backbone of the foundations of these two organizations, which are still today. So a lot of people say Germany just went underground, you know? Well, you remember the story was that our Germans are better than theirs, or the reason the Russians got into space before the Americans did. The first satellite was Russian. The first animal in space was Russian. The first, uh, I, I don't think they asked the animals for passports, but still... Uh, the first um, rocket that went around the moon was Russian. Uh, the United States was in deep trouble in terms of world prestige. And so, uh, uh, you know, I think we were trying to learn from flying saucers, and I think that's the role that Menzel played. People don't realize Menzel wrote a lot of science fiction. Uh, so he was skilled at putting together interesting but untrue scenarios like we can explain all the UFO sightings and stuff like that. Yeah, one one of the things was a, a documentary that the British brought out in the 70s, or the early, very late 70s, and it was called Alternative Free. And at that period, it was talking about an amalgamation of the American and the Russians working together for deep space. And at this particular time in the 70s, they were already showing what was like footage of, of the space shuttle, but the Russians. Um, and and so there was, you know, in this documentary, I don't know if, you've, if you're familiar with it, Mr. Friedman, but it was called Alternative Three. I remember 3. hearing the title Alternative Three, and I can't remember all the details. I'm, I'm getting old, you know, we, we lose some of it, and we don't use it very much, uh, <laughs> stories like that. Uh, well, you know, it is remarkable. Remember, we and the Russians had joint space shots, uh, you know, that that's a remarkable development and i'm very glad for it because if we're going to go any place out there we should be going as earthlings 
Terrans. Terrans, whatever you want. We're all on the same mothership. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, because, look, the United Nations does not allow representation from individual cities, at least the last time I checked, they didn't. Why would the Galactic Federation allow individual countries on a dumb little planet because uh, there seem to be loads of planets out there, something I wouldn't have said 60 years ago, <laughs> but I can say now. Uh, you know, good estimate, there are several billion planets in our own galaxy. Frank Drake uh, of the SETI program, silly effort to investigate, that's what SETI stands for, at one point was saying there might be 8,000 places in the galaxy that could send signals. A better number now would be 8 billion, uh, which makes us much less significant. But it also seems to me, to me, since we're talking about the Earth being 4.5 or so uh, billion years old and stars older than that around and so forth, it hardly seems likely that we're the most advanced. Uh, so it would seem that there's probably been a lot of interstellar travel, a lot of checking things out. And, you know, you have to find another place to go in case you have an asteroid mess up your planet, in case there's a plague, in case there's a nuclear war, whatever. You need to be ready with alternatives. <laughs> yeah, alternatives. <laughs> Two, three, four, five. Uh, and so if that's the situation, that is that there's loads of guys out there, somebody must have decided that we have to keep track of the primitives in the neighborhood who show signs of not being able to control themselves. Uh, every society, its major reason, presumably for a government, is to protect the welfare of the people and the security of the people. So uh, I think everybody out there is saying, okay, we gotta keep tabs on the primitives in the neighborhood, but only close tabs on those primitives who show signs of being able to bother us. And you can't wait till they get out here with their nasty weapons you got to try to say, hold it, fellas, get your act together first. We don't want you out here. And so, you know, in today's world, where young people keep saying, surely we're not the only ones, they've heard about the Kepler satellite results. I'm glad you, you know. brought that up. Let's keep going on that, because that's a very, very important thing. As I was saying last time, I said this again, I think, with you on air on the other show, and, of course, with Kathleen Martin again, anybody who is 18 years or younger was born after extraterrestrial planets were found and after Goldilocks planets were found. Anybody who's 22 years or younger was taught in kindergarten or forward uh, that planets exist outside our solar system. When I was in grade school, I was sure taught that there's nothing out there, that, that just stars and, and gas and dust and other stuff. So obviously things are dramatically changed. The, the number, the percentage of the youngsters that believe and have open minds that we are not the only ones is staggering. And that's why I'm hoping that we are finally moving in a direction where we've been at a standstill for decades. Well, let's hope so. And the thing is, when I talk about aliens, I think they're looking over the place, trying to make sure we don't do anything stupid, like come out and bother them. Uh, and, you know, it, it is an interesting question. Why didn't we go to the moon after Apollo 17? 18 and 19 were built. Crews were selected. Nixon said it would cost too much money. Uh, and I'm wondering whether some alien didn't say, hey, buddy, stay off our moon. We don't want you guys. There's that movie that came out recently, uh, the Transformer movies, where Buzz Aldrin takes a lead role in it in, in the beginning, where uh, oh. they say, right, we're dark on the moon, meaning that, you know, the satellites behind them, they're going to lose signal to the Earth for a while, so they've got this opportunity. And, uh, you know, I always remember the old Father Christmas statement from, from uh, I think it was Neil Armstrong, and, and conspiracy people would say that was a key word that there were ufos up there and it, it, and then when you see the actual scene from this uh, transformers movie what do you see you see a big ufo right on the edge of a crater um <laughs> and and i found that quite sort of ironic that a man that's been to the moon would take such a, a role and project that unless he was sort of letting out the secret you know uh, i think neil armstrong said just before he died that um you know 
there's a lot that's been undone and unsaid and it would come out it was a sort of secret line not secret but it was a sort of uh, a cryptid uh, speech that he made before he died and i wondered if that buzz aldrin scene was was part of their relinquish you know let me add one thing to that mr friedman in case you haven't seen that movie buzz aldrin not only played himself in that movie as the the second man on the moon who encountered ets but he played it as a serious role i mean the movie is, is could be comical it could be argued as a children's movie but when he his role his reactions in there he wasn't joking when he was speaking of any of this i and it, it makes you wonder it's like why would the the man on apollo 11 play in a fictional movie and discuss extraterrestrials on the moon and that's just what hit me the most he doesn't need the money he doesn't need the fame he's already got it well i'll tell you i've done two television shows with uh, buzz aldrin uh, there were other people there too. I'm not trying to make a partnership between him, and Buzz. but uh, he certainly wasn't admitting uh, to aliens on the moon uh, then. Now maybe times have changed, and uh, I, I spent some time with Bill Anders, another astronaut. He was on the first flight that went around the moon but didn't land, man flight. Uh, Anders, Borman, and Lovell, I guess, were the crew. And we were each chairing a session at a meeting of the American Nuclear Society many years ago, late 60s. And we got to talking about UFOs. Well, at first I asked him, I said, Bill, I've heard stories about the astronauts having had sightings. What, what can you tell me? He answered in a very careful fashion. Well, uh, I don't think there was anything that we couldn't identify and my strong feeling was I just touched on something classified, that he didn't want to lie to me, but he was being very cautious, or, you know, more cautious than seemed to be appropriate. And the funny thing is, I was going to be giving a lecture somewhere. I was working for Westinghouse, and I was giving a lecture on, on the way, trip home, and I had some of my books and stuff, not ones that I had written, but other books about UFOs with me, and he bought copies of everything I had. Uh, so it was great interest. And we find out, I found out more about astronaut sightings from the Condon Report, which came out later, than from Bill, which to me 